Swinburne University of Technology. Well, thank you very much for coming, coming out at night when you would rather be home with your family. I really appreciate your presence here. Um, one of my loves is these interlocking directorates. What on earth are they? What creates them? Well, when somebody sits on multiple boards, as many of our directors in Australia do, it creates something called an interlocking directorate or a multiple directorship. And looking at these links between directors and companies on whose boards they sit really helps create personal level ties. So researching in this area mixes the institutional, the, the company uh, level, with the personal level, the human level. So uh, my PhD was in this area, but you'll see later I link it with auditing because basically I'm an auditor. Now, once you get these interlocking directorates, you can also get variants of them through the board subcommittees that exist. So I'm not sure how many of you in the audience know about audit committees, so just a word on them. They're committees that are subcommittees of the board that have oversight responsibility for the audit. They don't do the audit, they liaise with the auditor. The auditor is not a member of these committees, but often attends meetings and informs the committee members. So very much an oversight role for the whole financial reporting process. There's also remuneration committees, which look after the executive remuneration and uh, recommend the packages that executives particularly, but also the non-executive directors uh, receive. How much of that's in cash, how much in stock options, what's the proportion, that sort of thing. And there's also nomination committees which are charged with the responsibility for succession planning for boards. Who are the next directors going to be? Who's going to be tapped on the shoulder to put themselves forward for election by the members, that is the shareholders? So I look at all these links between um, the board members, the directors, and these subcommittees. There are other committees that might be formed, but I'm particularly interested in these three. Now, these interlocking directorates, they create a bit of a dilemma because there's both good and bad about them. Firstly, we know from seminal work way back in the 1970s, Jensen and Meckling, that boards are very important. In our world where we've got separation of ownership and control, the role of boards and the demand for quality auditors who are invited to sit on multiple boards is very important. Uh, there's deliberate motivations for having these multiple quality directors. They uh, could represent collusion, which isn't such a good reason, uh, but more positively, it's been theorised that they monitor, they scan the business environment on behalf of other directors, they bring their experience to the board, they share their experiences, they give legitimacy to the company because of their high quality, um, if they're in demand to sit on multiple boards, and they also create, create these links of social cohesion between the board members of various companies and cooperation co-optation between these companies. So there's a lot of really positive things that can arise from these interlocking directorates. On the other hand, if a director sits on so many boards that they can't possibly pay sufficient appropriate attention to each company, then they're really breaching their fiduciary duty to the shareholders and to the other directors. and. Um, that's not a good thing. So you can see this is a bit of a two-edged sword which really sets up research questions very nicely when you've got that tension. Is this good or is it, has it got some problems? It really creates a nice tension to uh, investigate some of the research issues. Now in Australia, we have no restriction on interlocking. So a director can sit on as many boards as he or she wants. And I have to say it is mostly he's. It's a bit of an old boys network. It's changing, but very, very slowly. Um, in the US, for instance, there are 
restrictions on how many boards a, director's, a director can sit upon, particularly because of the strong US antitrust or anti-competitive anti uh, rules they have there. They actually prohibit interlocks within the same industry. So they don't pro prohibit interlocks, but just within the same industry. But we have nothing like that at all, no restriction at all. Um, what we do have is a requirement for shareholders to be fully informed about how many other board positions a director holds. So that's in the Corporations Act. And we have in the Australian Securities Exchange Corporate Governance Council principles and guidelines, um, or sorry, principles and recommendations, which are voluntary, they're on an if not, why not basis. If you don't follow the recommendations, you must explain in your annual report for a listed company, why not? But you don't have to obey the rules or recommendations in this document. But what it does say about this issue, these recommendations, is that all directors should consider the number and nature of their directorships and calls on their time from other commitments. So it really leaves it very much in the director's judgment as to when enough is enough and when they just shouldn't accept more board appointments or when they should actually start to retire from some they're already holding. Now, if you contrast that with what the Australian Shareholders Association has to say about it, it's a bit different. And again, there's nothing mandatory about this. this the Australian Shareholders Association has got no power at all over directors other than, um, I suppose, legitimacy, reputation risk, that sort of thing, pointing out some of the directors who might sit on many boards and when things go wrong, the Shareholders Association will be there pointing things out. But what is it suggests is that no person should hold more than five equivalent directorships and if you're the chair of the board, then that's considered to be at least two directorships in terms of the level of workload, but the Shareholders Association will have regard for the size, nature and complexity of all other directorships and personal associations and commitments because many of these directors sit on not-for-profit boards, they are on foundations and trusts, uh, as well as other listed company boards, sporting associations, they network. Uh, often very successfully. So the Shareholders Association isn't quite so keen on overdoing it with these directorships. Now in terms of research, this is really, truly an interdisciplinary area. It crosses marketing because you get the, the notion of um, directors marketing themselves, how they how they uh, network, how they sell themselves. You get the notion of um, industrial or organisational theory, sociological theory, and especially network analysis, which is a, a, a technique all in its own, uh, all, all of its own, looking at social networks, mapping them, uh, seeing who talks to who, who influences who. One of the most commonly used theories in this area is resource dependence theory. So the directors bring resources with them to each board on which they sit. They bring their knowledge, their experience, uh, resources back in their other com companies that might be helpful to a new company or to another company. Um, one of my PhD students, for instance, is looking at whether or not these directors share knowledge of accounting standards. It's not that long ago that Australia moved to international reporting standards. And this PhD student is looking at whether directors who sit on the same boards seem to be associated with the same choices that were made on adoption of those new accounting standards. That's just one area where you might apply this theory. Um, there's also quite Marxian theories about power and structure and um, especially to do with banks because often you find board members of banks sit on boards of other companies to which that bank has lent money. 
so that, that's often looked, viewed from a, a Marx perspective, a Marxian perspective. Uh, so this, this is a really rich area to, re to research because you can bring a number of conceptual frameworks to it uh, depending on what you're looking at. There's that automatic tension there uh, which helps create nice hypotheses. You usually need a bit of tension in an issue to create a good hypothesis, to create a good research study. And so it lends itself very much to this sort of um, research work that is often done in this area. Now these interlocking directorates, they have lots of benefits. They provide exposure to business and environmental scan through the director's experience, through the director's other networks, outside of the company and even outside of other companies because as I say often they're uh, involved with sporting or uh, golfing clubs, that sort of thing. They bring a standard of comparison, a benchmark if you like, to these companies um, and, and give them ideas about what is average for this industry or what, what should this particular issue look like? What should we be paying our executives? What would be a, a typical compensation package, for instance, in this industry for this level of executive? They often bring innovation because they diffuse innovations across the companies. We tend to see these innovations across a, all the companies on, on the boards for which they sit. Um, they bring insight because they've got this wider experience that they can bring to the issue, um, wider experience, knowledge, different management styles that they bring to bear, a source of counsel for the chair or other directors because they've got this experience that can be drawn upon. So there's lots of positives coming out of this list. Viewpoints that differ from those within the entity because these directors, they tend to be independent directors. That is, they're not involved in the day-to-day -day running of the company else they wouldn't have time to sit on all these boards. And so often they bring an external viewpoint that's not so entrenched in corporate politics that can bring objectivity to issues and suggestions on how to handle things. But they also bring prestige because many of these directors are sought after and they're considered to be high quality. So if you think about particular directors in our, amongst our listeds and how frequently their names crop up, um, often amongst the top 100 or top 200 ASX listed companies, you'll, you'll see what I mean. I think too, in Australia, because we're so geographically isolated, our east and west coasts, the, the distance between the coasts is so vast, we tend to have a pool of directors for the west and nearly or, or something like a quarter of our 2,000 listed companies are mining companies incorporated in Western Australia these days. It's just staggering. And so there tends to be a pool of directors in the West and a separate pool that handle all of the East Coast. Of course, there's some commuting, but that's the way it tends to be because of the, just the logistics of, and the distance of, uh, uh, between these two coasts that we've got. So that also con tends to concentrate the pool of directors, I think, in Australia as well. Now, as well as the benefits, we've got some disadvantages. They do provide potential for collusion, and that is, of course, what the US is worried about with the antitrust rules and especially pricing and trans in, in, um, transfer pricing, that sort of thing. Anti all sorts of anti-competitive behaviours and collusion. They reduce the opportunities for others, particularly women, I'm afraid, because as I say, it tends to be a bit of an old boys network amongst our directors. And whilst that's changing, it's not changing very fast. And in fact, the latest iteration of those ASX corporate governance guidelines and recommendations has really made gender diversity an issue to be reported on. Uh, again, not setting quotas, but the threat is there if companies don't act that 
in the long run quotas might be introduced. It's just a matter of reporting the proportion of females at each level, not just directors, but other levels as well, in the latest set of guidelines we've got. Um, it, I mean, we, we do know there's a lot of other research that shows that having gender diversity on boards, in fact, all sorts of diversity, really assists company to, companies to perform well. Uh, there's, the research is almost irrefutable now that companies perform better with females on the board as well. Um, if directors sit on too many boards and they spread their time too thinly, then that might affect long-run company performance. It can create conflicts of interest, particularly uh, uh, on legal matters, if one company's suing another or if there's a supplier uh, running out of stock and one company wants it and the other, one co the other company wants the same sort of uh, stock, it can create conflicts of interest. Another really interesting feature of Australian corporate life is that these directors do tend to sit on companies in the same industry. And it's more than just the east-west thing I was talking about before. Uh, it just wouldn't be permitted in the US. It can also, this is more a Marxist point of view, causes elitism and the concentration of economic power and in just a few hands. Some very powerful boards, board members we've got in Australia who sit on eight, ten boards uh, isn't unusual in Australia but quite unheard of in other countries. So that brings me to my real love which is auditing. So here I'm talking about external audit or independent audit of the financial statements. So I'm not talking about internal audit, auditors who work for a company, I'm talking about the external audit provided by public accounting firms like Ernst & Young, KPMG, Deloitte, PwC, they're the big four, but there's many other smaller firms as well, like Picture Partners. So that's the sort of audit I'm talking about here. And an audit, just in case you haven't really ever come across what is an external audit? What do auditors do? Well, it's a process that is meant to add assurance to the financial statements, a level of assurance that gives the financial statements credibility and reinforces the integrity of the share market and really our market wouldn't be as efficient as it is without good quality auditing. And what makes good quality auditing is to have competent auditors in the first place, but secondly to have them highly independent, objective, unbiased, not close to the company, quite distant, keeping their objectivity, their sceptical nature is, is really what the professional standards say, to be sceptical. So they can't afford auditors to get close to management or directors at all. And another really interesting aspect of audit is that it's very hard to judge the quality of audit. Does one supplier supply higher quality than another supplier of audit? Very hard to judge, even if you're in the company, because auditors, by their very nature, can't let you see their working papers. That would give away exactly what they're doing, what they're going to test, and what records they're going to look at. So they can't do that that they can't even tell you what they intend to test. That would be giving away um, too much. They might tell the audit committee some things, but they're not going to divulge a lot. So it's actually quite hard to really get the feel for whether an audit is a quality audit or not. And so it's very much word of mouth that uh, spreads the word about whether or not a particular audit firm does a good job or not, is easy to work with, um, is respectful of staff in the company, that sort of thing. In fact, audit's been termed something called a credence good. Even when you've experienced inside a company, often it's still very difficult to know the quality of this good. Uh, you've really got to go on the reputation of the firm and Often, as I say, it's word of mouth that spreads this knowledge of this reputation. And who better than 
interlocking directors who've experienced the product of a particular auditor to be telling um, other directors what a particular audit firm's like, what a particular audit partner's like. We're very fortunate in Australia with this sort of research because we get to know the actual partner's name. In the US they don't. But in Australia, it's a requirement of the accounting stan auditing standards that the directors, sorry, the audit partner actually sign the audit report. So we can go right down to the audit partner level. So another benefit of this sharing of knowledge, etc., is this idea that uh, the directors who have experience of several auditors across all the companies on whose boards they sit, they might really get to know the audit firm well and recommend it for other boards to consider, recommend that auditor for other boards to consider. It's technically the shareholders who appoint the auditor at an annual general meeting, but that's really a technicality because the auditor has to be nominated first to be elected by the shareholders, and so it's the directors who do that. Um, ask the auditor if he or she is willing to be nominated. Usually they are, they'd like the business please. And so the directors and managers do have a lot to do with it even though technically it's the shareholders who appoint. So does this create a problem? We do know that auditors tend to be associated with the same director time and time again. In other words, if you've got a multiple director, chances are on a number of the boards on which they sit, maybe not all, but a good proportion of them will also have the same audit firm. And this has been, this was really my PhD and it was found to be the case previously in another study as well, but um, looking, I used early data from uh, 1993 on microfiche <laughs> um, in those days and hardly any women were in my sample, I'll tell you. And it was just astounding how many times the same audit firm became associated with the same director. And then we had more big audit firms, they've merged and that number has gone from what was then the big eight to now the big four. So that's probably concentrated it even more. Uh, so the, th the question is, is this an issue for auditor independence? I've said before that you need that independence to really create a good quality audit. If you've got these economic bonds between the auditor and the clients, not just a single client, but a whole family of clients networked through directors, does that cause issues for in auditor independence, for this objectivity, for this propensity to be sceptical and take that sceptical attitude towards everything to do with the company's financial reporting. And if losing one client means the whole family of clients goes, does that breed compliant auditors or does it make the auditor more aware and better uh, able to do a good job because he or she doesn't want to lose the whole family of audit clients. So there's another tension that really lends itself to research in this area. So some of the work that I've been involved with, often with others, um, involves looking at some of these issues around auditor links between sorry, links between directors and auditors. So this particular study, this was um, an honour student, Nick Courtney, who took this issue and looked at how long the auditor tenure was with and without these link links. And he found very distinct evidence that there was longer tenure if these links, the more the links occurred, there was longer tenure, uh, that um, auditors switching, that is changing to a new audit firm, happened less frequently once these links were in place. And the higher the number of links between directors and the audit firm, the less likelihood there was of an audit switch. And the m greater likelihood there was of the audit firm being retained for at least four years. Now it's 
no coincidence that our professional standards um, since the downfall of HIH, I don't know if you can remember HIH, in 2001, two, when HIH collapsed, it was a huge collapse in Australia. It was really our largest bankruptcy. And it was followed not long after by OneTel, um, which was even bigger. But I, I don't know how many of these names you recall, but there was a spate of collapses around that time in Australia. And the same thing was going on overseas as well in the US. Not only did we have 9-11, of course, but we had the collapse of Enron, WorldCom, and several others at the same time. And all of that brought attention, particularly on audit quality, and there were changes to the way in which audit, um, the audit regime was conducted. And one of the things that happened was that a limit was put on how long a partner, not the firm, how long the audit partner could serve on a single audit. And that limit was placed at five years. So it's quite interesting that Nick Courtney found four years was the tendency if these links were present. Other work we've done. Uh, this study looks, looked not at the board, but the audit committee members. So these audit committee members are a subset of the board. They're usually independent or non-executive directors. That's the recommendation that they not be working day to day in the company. And this study actually looked really at a very granular level of interrelationships between audit committee members and the audit partners, remembering, of course, we are able to get that data in Australia. And it found that reporting quality, financial reporting quality, and accounts, accounting researchers have a way of measuring this. They use something called discretionary accruals to measure financial reporting quality. Uh, these are accruals um, as opposed to cash accounting. Might not mean a whole lot to you, but some of these accruals that accountants make because not all the bills have been paid yet or not even all the invoices might be in yet. They accrue things to uh, report at particular balance dates. And some of this is discretionary, but something like depreciation is not discretionary. It has to take place that you depreciate your assets. You can vary the way you do that, the method you use, but the accounting standard says you must depreciate. So some of these accruals are discretionary and some are not. And the higher the discretionary portion, the more it's argued we've got evidence of the manipulation or management of the accounting numbers. So this is quite a big area of research in accounting. How much are the accounting numbers managed? Because we know numbers are managed. They're highly political, usually, these accounting numbers. Many bonuses depend on them. The lenders don't like to see, uh, for instance, the ratio between debt and equity too high, or else they'll stop lending. So they're, they're quite of a political nature, some of these accounting numbers. And this study found that the more of these links between the audit committee members and the actual audit partners, the more likely there was to be lower financial reporting quality because of these higher amounts of discretionary accruals. It looked at a few other measures of financial reporting quality as well, but that's probably enough just to get the message from that study. The next study I want to talk about again was an honours student at ANU where I was until this year. And Rita Lind, she did so much work to collect how much money the audit committee members were paid above and beyond their directorship fees. So remembering these are largely non-executive directors, some companies pay their subcommittee members extra fees above and beyond the fee for being a director. She collected all these fees where they were present, not every company pays them, and she looked at where there were these multiple board members and she found that if there were competing board memberships, sorry, competing audit committee memberships, then the tendency was to attend more meetings where there was payment above and beyond <laughs> director's fees and these were quite small amounts. 
They're not big amounts, like $2,000 a meeting. For these sorts of directors, that is not a lot of money. But there had been prior studies that showed that even board members will attend more board meetings if they're paid. So this was a, a, a really interesting study that um, Rita did that required a lot of work to get the level of incremental fees paid to audit committee members above and beyond their director fees and then to collect, hand collect, none of this is in a database, how many meetings were held, how many meetings each member attended and see whether there was a relationship there and there was. And then more recent research looks at auditor choice. So uh, Professor Keith Houghton, who was my PhD supervisor and who's come here to Swinburne with me as a, an adjunct, he's uh, a professor emeritus at ANU, but has embraced Swinburne, which is really lovely. Uh, so we've got this study that looks at whether, when there is an auditor change, whether the director auditor links to the new auditor are more or less than the links to the old auditor. And we found they're actually more to the new auditor. In other words, the switch is towards um, auditors where there's already links between the director and the auditor, where there's more of those links. It's really quite telling. And then the last study, I alluded before to these families of fees coming from all the interrelated clients. What we did, and again it was a great deal of work, we added up all the audit fees from all of the clients associated with a single director, again and again and again for the whole 2000 listed company, companies, and we looked at whether the proportion of fees attributable to families of these linked companies, linking between the director and the auditor, seemed to have any effect on audit fees. And we found that there were discounts, which is a little bit worrying, because if audit firms are actually lowballing or keeping their fees below cost to try to maintain the whole family of clients, uh, the worry is auditors won't be objective, they'll fail to say, hey, there's something wrong with these accounts when they really should, so as not to upset the client. Now all of that really led to um, an area of mutual interest. I'm, I joined Swinburne on the 21st of January this year, and I came in before Christmas last year to meet the Dean. The Dean was giving his inaugural lecture and I was invited along. And I had 20 minutes with him before he had to give his lecture. That's all we had. And I hadn't looked up his research area and he hadn't looked up mine. And within that 20 minutes we discovered we had research in common. It was just phenomenal. And I came away from that meeting having suggested an idea for another go at an Australian Research Council grant. We don't know the outcome yet. We'll know very soon. We brought in Professor Houghton and another colleague of Michael Gilding's, Dean Lusher, and my idea was to look at whether executive remuneration and the tie, the nexus, between that remuneration and corporate performance was in any way connected with these interlocked directors. In other words, Directors should have knowledge of what works, what motivates managers and executives, what doesn't motivate them. Put together these packages uh, with a, a percentage of options, a percentage of bonus, a percentage of cash. What works best? So my idea is that these sorts of messages about what works best in particular circumstances, particular industries, might be spread across all the companies on which a, a particular board member sits. And so I expect to find some relationship between the mix of the executive remuneration and the, the um, number of interlocked directors. But more than that, my love of course is the audit, so we brought in audit because wherever you've got bonuses tied to accounting numbers, you get higher audit risk. There's a tendency 
for managers, if they've got any power, to manage the accounting numbers to maximise their bonus. It's a bit of a cynical view of the world. It doesn't mean everybody does it, but it means on average this goes on, and we know it goes on. It's been found again and again that where there are bonuses, there tends to be management of accounting numbers. So um, we're hypothesising that there's a relationship between audit fees and these interlocking directorates and the remuneration packages. And we're going to use quite sophisticated social network analysis tools to try to unravel that question. And I hope we do the research whether or not we get the grant. So in concluding, there's some important public policy aspects of this work. Um, at the moment, there's no restriction, as I say, and our ge ge geography really accentuates the problem. Should our regulators be looking at the number of directorships and putting some limit on it? Secondly, is trying to get more females on boards because there's a limited pool of females who are being tapped on the shoulder to be on boards, is that just going to make this issue worse, the issue of audit independence? And lastly, our accounting professional body, the CPAs and the Institute of Chartered Accountants, their professional standards are all pitched at auditors at the individual level um, and the individual client level. So they get working papers, they look at individual audits, there's peer review of the audit to see if it was done well, are there loose ends, would a peer have audited in the same way, come to the same conclusion. All of that's done on a single audit, single client, and yet Potentially it's these families of clients that might be the issue. And they're not even on the regulatory radar. So we really think this sort of work's got public policy implications um, that we keep putting forward. Uh, the regulators haven't picked it up yet, but um, this is the sort of impact that research can have. We've had other research that has made impacts that have made regulators look at particular issues. So I hope you have whetted your appetite for research particularly, but what you might think about with something as familiar as directors. So thank you very much. This has been a Swinburne production.